Hey Earth Science, so you may be noticing that uh, this week the video looks a little bit different and I want to tell you why. One, uh, because when we went to do remote learning that was something that all the teachers had to learn how to do immediately. There wasn't any, you know, training period, there wasn't any kind of orientation or anything, it was just do it. And so um, basically everything that I've been doing up to this point has been an experiment in uh, one form or another. Sometimes it's how can I teach the best, like, you know, teacher to student communication wise. Sometimes it's how can I actually get this done by the time you need it, you know, like production wise. So um, since it's all been experimentation up until this point, um, I think that your class is the one that I've settled on a format um, the most um, I kind of settled on a format and didn't didn't change it up so much and I want to reconsider that because I mean eh, I think I could do better so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna experiment with another format um, I'd love to get some feedback and just tell me whether it matters uh, whether it made it better, whether you like can't stand what you're seeing and hearing anymore, but um, I want to do my best for you, and I want to make sure that you know you're getting um, not just the uh, you know not just the the book stuff, but like the 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 Mr. Estes stuff, the the thing that makes this a class and not just a guided reading tour, if you understand what I mean. Anyway. Um, yeah, let's get started. We're actually in uh, chapter 22 right now because we're um, doing the atmosphere. I'm going to see how much of this I can do in one sitting. If I can do the entire chapter, I'm sure my throat will be killing me, but um, at least I'll be done. All right, let's 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 do this. Um, oh, sorry. So we got to make sure my clicker's on. So um, as you can see, there's three sections in this chapter. Um, first section is characteristics of the atmosphere. Um, second section um, is solar energy in the atmosphere and third section is about atmospheric circulation so um, we've got these objectives and rather than naming them one at a time I'm gonna put them all up and this is the kind of thing that you don't need to write down because it's like in your textbook but I'm just gonna mention them and anything that's important that you ought to write down as if we were taking notes uh, that's gonna be here in this space Okay, so describe the composition of Earth's atmosphere, explain how two types of barometers work, identify the layers of the atmosphere, and identify two effects of air pollution. All right, so we're, we're talking about the atmosphere as a thing. Remember, it was one of the four spheres back from the uh, pre-Mr. Estes days. Well, uh, here we're coming back to this sphere. So let's talk about the composition of the atmosphere. Just lay this all out here. Okay. So you know what the atmosphere is um, in terms of it being a sphere. Let me write it down anyway, okay? So anything that is important, as in it's not just, you know, details um, uh, over over there, or wait, no, down, down there, sorry. I, I haven't made a video in this format yet. I didn't know where it would be. It's down there, down there. All that stuff, maybe not necessary that you commit all of that to memory because it's just um, you know textbook boiled down um, the stuff that I write down would be the things that I would have written on the board and therefore are noteworthy like literally worthy of your notes so atmosphere that is one of the uh, you know four spheres um, of earth science and it is the um, mixture of gases that surrounds the earth it's um, funny to think that it's actually um, a mixture um, because we tend to think of it as like one thing. Um, in fact, way back in, you know, olden times when the uh, five elements were earth, water, um, air, fire, and um, well, quintessence, the fifth one, um, it was like a thing. It was like pure, but it's not even. It's a mixture, which is a little funny. So the most abundant elements in the air are the gases, nitrogen, oxygen and argon we can actually um, 
make this uh, be quantitative. So we've got 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen, 21% uh, is oxygen, and um, just right there, that's approximately 80 and 20. So you can actually um, do this. Let's see if my hand hits here. So if you put up five fingers, okay, four of those fingers are nitrogen, one of those fingers, and for today, a thumb is a finger, is oxygen. That's basically the whole atmosphere. Um, there are some traces, though, because as you can see, we have 1% left over. Um, that 1% is split up like this, 0.9% argon, and then 0.1% other. Um, other notably includes um, carbon dioxide and water vapor. Okay, so um, the two most abundant compounds uh, are um, water vapor and carbon dioxide. As you can see, nitrogen and oxygen are just elements, right? Um, those are both um, elements from the periodic table. So is argon, um, but oxygen, I'm sorry, uh, water, water vapor, H2O, and carbon dioxide are both compounds. All right, and it's not just gases, right? The atmosphere also has like lots of dust and smoke and all that kind of stuff in it. Anyway, that's what the atmosphere is made of. Um, but we've also got to talk about, let's see, what is um, next year? Oh, so this is a thing that happens sometimes. My, my clicker freezes up. Oh, here we go. So nitrogen. Got it. So um, this actually is something that has to do with ecology. This is the nitrogen cycle. Um, makes up most of the atmosphere. And so this is actually something that's kind of cool, if you don't mind me saying so. Have you ever heard of these? Amino acid. You've probably heard of them, um, maybe from like life science, um, amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. Um, if you have ever had or seen like a, a protein shake that like a, a an athlete might drink if they're trying to build some muscle, it's usually full of amino acids. And I want to point out a similarity of amino acid to another word that you might know, and that is ammonia. So ammonia is a cleaning product. It smells bad. Um, <laughs> and uh, there is this similar root in them. They both have this root amon or amine. Um, and that root actually means nitrogen. That's what that means. So it turns out that um, all organic compounds contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Um, but the ones that contain nitrogen are usually proteins. And the reason is because um, proteins are made of many amino acids. Amino acids contain nitrogen. There's the nitrogen. Ammonia similarly contains um, uh, nitrogen. In fact, its uh, chemical formula is NH3. Okay, so why am I talking about um, ecology and ammonia and amino acids and proteins? in an earth science class. It's because of one of the ways that the biosphere and the atmosphere interact with each other. So in order to get protein from food, you would need to be able to have a food source that contains nitrogen. Now, how does a living creature get nitrogen? Well, the, um, the easiest way, like if we're talking about a consumer would be to consume nitrogen, which means that it needs to be in producers. The only way for nitrogen to be in the food chain is if plants contain it. So how do plants get it? Well, they get carbon dioxide from the air. There's way more nitrogen. So do they just absorb the nitrogen from the air? Turns out they can't. Plants cannot use atmospheric nitrogen. So how do they get it? Turns out that bacteria in soil are able to um, take in atmospheric nitrogen, and then they produce nitrates. A nitrate, um, if you remember way back from when we were doing um, 
uh, minerals and um, the, like, the uh, atoms and compounds and crystals and stuff. Um, nitrates is a kind of um, it, it, it's a it, it's a mineral group and it maybe obviously by its name contains nitrogen nitrates are also um, uh, commonly found in like plant food like fertilizers and the products of these bacteria they're called nitrogen fixing bacteria are nitrates like like ammonia and it's actually those that plants are able to absorb. So just a little little side quest on our uh, on our main course to understand the atmosphere is that the most abundant in ingredient in the atmosphere is necessary for the construction of proteins and plants can't even use it. They require it to be um, processed by good bacteria in soil um, and that's just one of the things that us science teachers love to bring up whenever we're studying bacteria to be like, look, bacteria aren't all bad. Some of them are actually like necessary for life because they take nitrogen out of the atmosphere and give it to plants. Anyway, so we got our atmosphere. We got the composition. We talked about um, the nitrogen that's in it. Now let's move on to the next slide. So we got... Um, oxygen in the atmosphere. So we know that oxygen um, takes up about 20% 20, 20 of the atmosphere, uh, 21 to be more precise. And um, oxygen, we talked about way back when we were doing like the periods of geological history, um, is poisonous to some things because of its, uh, because of its chemistry. But all most life today, um, cause there are some like anaerobic bacteria are adapted to require oxygen for metabolism, but a lot of oxygen is produced by photosynthesis. So we've got um, about 20%, 21% oxygen here, and the 21% oxygen um, is um, produced by photosynthesis. And I'm sure you've heard all about photosynthesis in life science. Photosynthesis um, is something that is done by plants as well as algae and some bacteria. And um, it's just respiration in reverse. Um, so you respirate, you take food and you breathe in oxygen and you do some chemistry that changes that into carbon dioxide that you breathe out, water that you get rid of some other way that I don't want to have to mention, and then also energy, which is what you get out of food. That's why you eat. Plants just do that in reverse. They take energy, which they get from the sun. They breathe in carbon dioxide, and they absorb water through their roots to get... Um, uh, a sugar, a food product, and then they release oxygen. Anyway, um, don't need to spend too much time in life science in this earth science um, class. So it's produced by photosynthesis, and then it is um, needed for respiration. Okay, so... Yeah, you all know that oxygen is important. Like that, that didn't come as a surprise, right? Okay, well, um, after oxygen, um, we've got something else. Man, this this clicker is really bugging me. All right, so water vapor. Okay, so we talked about water vapor some when we were doing the water cycle about how water is um, evaporated into the air, um, like off of um, off of the ground, out of the ocean, um, uh, off of rivers, but it's also transpirated through um, animals and plants. So um, because uh, water vapor is, um, is added to the air by processes that are not constant during the day, the actual amount of water vapor in the air may vary. So, um, yeah, so water vapor 
in the air is due to, you know, evaporation, transpiration. What um, chapter was it when we were doing the water cycle? It was, it was like chapter 19, wasn't it? It, it was like our first um, remote learning chapter. So you can go back and review that. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, levels may vary from place to place and uh, day to day. Um, actually, I'm curious um, what the humidity is right now. There was a time, um, actually it was when I was in school, that um, I was I took a trip out to Utah um, and I wanted to know what the weather would be so I could pack clothes. The t uh, when I was looking up the um, humidity here in Pennsylvania, it was 63%. In Utah, it was 36 uh, So right now, um, uh, Sunday evening, I have a humidity of 50%. Um, it's going to be different on um, some other day. So uh, this isn't an official homework assignment, but it would be cool if one of you, some of you, all of you, would uh, just... Whenever you watch this video, look up the humidity. Uh, just search the internet for the weather. Um, find the humidity and uh, tell me what it is. Anyway, so water vapor levels vary place to place, day to day. Has to do with factors like how hot the sun is to cause evaporation. Um, you know, whether the uh, air happens to be near the ocean or not. Okay, so reading check. I'm just going to skip that nonsense. Um, so, bye-bye. Composition of the atmosphere continued. Ozone. This one's fun. So, ozone is a gas molecule that's made up of three oxygen atoms. So, ozone, even though it's made completely out of oxygen, is not O2, which is the kind of oxygen that your body can use. So, this is actually poisonous. Fortunately, it's way, way high up. So, ozone. This oxygen is O2, kind of like this water vapor is H2O. Ozone is actually O3. And um, there is a layer of ozone. Um, it's called the ozone layer. Very creative name. And um, it is a buffer. Um, I don't know if that's the right word. It's a protective layer in the atmosphere that absorbs ultraviolet light. So um, we will get to where that is exactly when we actually go through the layers of the atmosphere. But it's important that it absorbs ultraviolet light because ultraviolet light is what we call ionizing radiation, which means that um, the energy in a uh, wave of uh, ultraviolet light is high enough to kick electrons off of atoms. And that can, well break molecules. And unfortunately, DNA is made of molecules, which means that um, ultraviolet light is able to destroy your DNA. Now, your DNA has lots of repair mechanisms and safety checks, but, I mean, you get enough damages. A few of them are going to slip through the cracks, and then they're going to be copied every single time that your cell, um, your cells duplicate and... Um, make more copies of themselves. Anyway, so we had nitrogen, we had oxygen, we had water vapor. Now we got ozone. There is more, but we are going to go to the particulates. Particulates can be volcanic dust, ash from fires, microscopic organisms. These are just all the non-gaseous things, tiny solid particles that are in the air as well. Okay, so um, kind of like, man, we never got to finish that um, uh, sediments in water thing because, you know, we never went back to school to play with microscopes. Sadness. Um, the uh, particles that were the smallest took the longest to settle out of the water, and the same is true of the air. Um, it will take a long time for small particles to fall out of the air. Heavy ones tend to fall uh, faster. Okay, so um, really there's nothing to take from this other than 
yeah, there's there's junk in the air too. But you knew that. Okay, let's talk about atmospheric pressure. This one is good. So atmospheric pressure is force per unit area that is exerted on a surface by the weight of the atmosphere. I'm going to draw you a little diagram, okay? So the first thing that we need to know is something that's called the kinetic theory of matter. And because this isn't like a physics class, I don't need to give you a full definition of this. Um, but the idea behind the kinetic theory of matter, I think that might be, there we go behind the kinetic theory of matter is that all atoms are moving all the time. Um, so I'll just write atoms move constantly. And if atoms are moving constantly, it means that they are also colliding constantly. And whenever two um, atoms collide with each other, that of course causes a push. So atoms push each other constantly. Now, if you are made of atoms, and I expect that you are, at least your body is, then that means that the molecules in the air are constantly hitting you. Okay, so let's just uh, draw it kind of like this. So I'm going to... Um, use blue for air, I guess, because that makes sense. Um, whole bunch of molecules in the air, and they're all just like, view, 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 view. yeah, whizzing around really quick. And they're all hitting each other and running into each other like some kind of crazy random bumper cars. Okay, so let's say you've got a surface. I'm just going to make it be the uh, edge of this box, okay? So we got a surface. Those air particles are also hitting it. Boo, boo, boo. They're also hitting it. And I know each little particle is, like, really tiny, so each little hit is very weak. But there's, like, trillions of trillions of trillions of them, which means it adds up. It turns out that the amount of force that those... Um, molecules of air are exerting on this box amounts to be about 14 pounds for every square inch. Man, that is a lot. Okay, so 14 pounds, that's like, um, oh, let's see, a gallon of of water or milk is about 8 pounds, which means that 14 pounds is almost two gallons um a gallon is about let's just say um three two liter bottles of soda um or you know three two liter bottles anything else you have 14 pounds maybe like a small dog or something um <laughs> a very large baby so um 14 pounds per square inch is the amount of force with which air is pushing on all things. And it's just because it's made out of particles that are moving all the time. And um, there's more to it than that, because if you think about it, um, you've got a couple miles of air sitting on top of you. I know air is very light, so it's not that hard to lift up. After all, you are able to get up through the air. But the fact that there's so much on top of us adds to the weight. Okay, so that's what the deal is with air pressure. And it's worth noting that as long as you're surrounded by air, the air will be pushing on that surface, okay? So um, the uh, air isn't just pushing on that side, it's pushing on the top, pew, pew, pew. That's, that's the pushing sound effect, by the way. It's pushing on the bottom, pew, 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 which means that if it's pushing on all sides, it could actually cause this to, col to collapse, if it's strong enough, that is. Most objects can withstand 14 square inches. Um, I'm sorry, 14 pounds of uh, uh, per square inch of pressure. I mean, you can, um, but uh, it's on all sides. So that's why, like, you know, air pressure is, isn't constantly like pushing things around. Okay. So if we're going to talk about air pressure, I'd have to guess that the next thing we're going to talk about is barometers. And a barometer is 
a device that measures air pressure. Um, some people have like a barometer and a hydrometer and a thermometer all together. Those are really cool. Um, oh, no, it wasn't barometers quite yet. So, uh, <laughs> so the deal is that um, the reason that we even have an atmosphere is because it's held down um, by Earth's gravity. So uh, what we have is air pressure, and it's actually on what's called a gradient, and it works like this. So here's the surface of the Earth. Most of the air is down by the surface because it's held down by Earth's gravity. Okay, Most of the air is down here. You um, have 99% of the air within 32 kilometers of the Earth's surface. Um, I think that's 20 miles, I think. Yeah, I think that's about 20 miles. And so the further up you get, the more spaced out that air is. If you've got less particles, that means you've got less collisions, that means less pushes, and that means less pressure. You get up to a certain height and there's so little air that you basically feel no pressure at all. And at that point, we would just say you're in space and you're out of the atmosphere. However, it is gradual. And the reason that there's any air on the planet at all is because it's held down by gravity. Okay, so there's our uh, air pressure gradient. Now are we going to talk about barometers? Maybe we'll talk about barometers now. And you know what? Maybe if the slides don't take us to barometers, maybe I'll just make it. Uh, atmospheric pressure also changes as a result of differences in temperature, the amount of water vapor. Okay, so there are other factors that can change um, pressure. This is almost like a physics thing. Um, sometimes on the weather, you might hear of a low pressure or a high pressure system, and we'll talk about weather um, later. But um, gases can respond to factors. Uh, heat makes things expand. And if you expand, that means you're kind of pushing outward. Um, but also the particles are further apart, which means there's less pre uh, less collisions. Um, so temperature and humidity um, can have effects on the pressure. Um, if you uh, know of someone who can tell the weather by when it hurts, <laughs> uh, you know, like, oh, my knee's acting up, it's gonna rain. It's because they're feeling a change in air pressure that's um, corresponding to a, uh, a weather system. All right, so um, I got to get to the next slide. Oh, okay, there we go, there's air pressure. Okay, finally, we're getting to a barometer. So, all right, so, um, Let's, oh uh, yeah, barometers. So uh, pressure is uh, measured, let me just close that door. <sighs> pressure is measured in a couple different units. One of them is called atmospheres, which is just really awesome because that means that air pressure is one atmosphere. It's just how much the atmosphere is. Also millimeters or inches of mercury, which is interesting, and something called millibars. So, um, just for some equivalences, one atmosphere, which is abbreviated ATM, is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. HG is the you know periodic table abbreviation for mercury, or 1,000 millibars, which would be one bar. Like, why do we need two names for the same thing? Don't know. So, um, 1,000. MB, yeah. Okay. There's actually another unit for pressure that's used in physics. It's called Pascal. And um, atmospheric pressure in Pascals is over 100,000. It's like 101,325 or something. Pascals are very, very small. Um, we're usually going to stick with atmospheres, um, but sometimes you'll see pressure reported in terms of millimeters of hydrogen. So uh, I'm going to tell you how barometers work, but um, at least for now we can have that a barometer is something that measures air pressure.
Okay, so how do they do it? Oh man, it's, it's always experimental. So here's the thing, I wanna experiment, experiment with new formats, but the time that it takes to actually produce something is so great that I can't afford to not give you my tests, right? So I experiment with something, it's gonna take me like the entire time uh, I can't just make this look at it, decide I don't like it and not give it to you unless it's a total catastrophic failure. I have to give it to you. Otherwise, um, I've lost all that time. So the mercury, let's talk about a mer mercurial barometer. So here's how a mercurial, uh, mercurial <laughs> barometer works. Okay, so if you, here, here, here's the steps. So for a mercurial barometer, say you take a container, okay? Fill it up with mercury. And just put some mercury in here. I know mercury is like actually silvery, but I just need to use a, a colored marker. Okay, now if you were to submerge a cup uh, into that mercury, so it was filled and underneath of it, then turn it upside down and lift it up. And this is actually something you can do with water, okay? So you submerge a cup. That's a, that's a cup down there, okay? It's inside the mercury, it's, it's completely full. Then, turn the cup upside down, still full of mercury. Okay, here's the trick. Pick the cup up without removing it from the mercury entirely. So what you've got now is Okay. So here the mercury is inside the cup, it's outside the cup. Here, the mercury is still inside and outside the cup. So now, here's the thing. When you turn it upside down and lift it like this, the mercury is still inside above this line. So you might ask, well, why doesn't it just dump out? Okay, you ever do that trick? Um, now that we're not in the school building, I can safely give this one away to you. You ever do that trick where you poke a hole in a water bottle, but you keep the lid on, and then when they open the lid, it starts to leak out that hole? Have you ever done that? Um, if you have, shame on you. But um, the way that that works is the water can't leak out of the hole because there's no air coming in to replace it. Air pressures keeping the water in the bottle. In this particular case, the mercury can't just drain out because then there wouldn't be anything in the top of this. It would be a vacuum. And it turns out there is a very slight vacuum. And it turns out that if we could uh, zoom in on this, um, let's see, I don't know if I have enough room on this page. It's a shame. I didn't, I'm, I'm just gonna have to put it here and you're gonna have to know what I'm talking about. Okay. So this right here is that I had to make it a little longer. This is the tube of mercury that's sticking out. The mercury actually only comes up to a point. And above that point is actually nothing. There's nothing up there, not even air. I don't think I spelled vacuum correctly. No, I didn't. I'm thinking of vaccine. There's only one C in vacuum. There we go. That's, yeah, that's That was my arrow. That was what I intended it to be all along. That's a vacuum, nothing up there, not even air. Down there is mercury, 
and it is standing up out of this. How high up does it stand? Well, see, the only reason that it's still up there is because air pressure is pushing down on this, keeping the level down while the mercury inside the tube is trying to drain out, which would raise this level. And they get this balance when this is 760 millimeters high. That's why it's called 760 millimeters of mercury. And um, yeah, that's, that's one way of measuring air pressure to see how low or how, how high up it can keep a stack of mercury inside of a tube. Anyway, that is a mercurial thermometer, thermom barometer. It's a mercur, speaking is hard, mercurial barometer. There's another kind that's called an aneroid barometer. So once again, it's a sealed container. There is a partial vacuum and it works like this. So let's say you've got a sealed container. This is an aneroid. This is kind of similar to how like the safety buttons on like a, a bottle, like a bottle of Snapple works, where after you open it, it pops up. It's kind of similar to that. So aneroid barometer, you got a container that has some pressure in it, but not much. And then outside that is normal air pressure. So we could say we've got this at some sort of balance. Okay, so here's what happens. If the air pressure goes up, it squeezes the box and um, you just have to have some sort of like needle attached to it. So let's say we got like a, a needle on it, okay? And here's our um, air pressure high and low. And there, there it is pointing right in the middle. When the air pressure is high, um, kind of might look like this. The box get all squeezed. Ooh, that poor box. And it made the needle um, poke up because there's just so much air pressure. It's squeezing the box to look like a bow tie or something. Still that very weak air pressure inside. On the other hand, if the air pressure went down, then the box would kind of bloat a little bit. Do you get the idea that when the air pressure of the contents of the box is constant, then it will flex depending on what the air pressure is outside. It'll either puff up because air pressure isn't keeping it small or it will shrink down because the air pressure inside can't keep the shape to compete with the atmosphere. Okay, so we got barometers, the mercurial ones and the aneroid ones. Um, let's see what else we have. I think we still have to do the layers of the atmosphere. Get out of here, you read and check. Read and check. Okay. Layers of the atmosphere. Okay. So um, I'm going to make a decision here. Um, I've been recording this for about 40 minutes. I'm going to cut this off right here, make this its own video, because the layers of the atmosphere is enough of a topic to be its own thing and I don't want this to keep going on and on. Okay, well, um, I guess that's that for now. See you in the rest of the section.